Hey everybody, this is TJR. This is going to be a little bit different. This is not a formal review. I'm just going to kind of give my thoughts and impressions. Last night, I finally got to see the movie The Shape of Water. I, I realize this film has been out for a couple months. Everybody's already reviewed it and talked about it. My talking about it is nothing new here. But after watching it last night, there's no way that I can't not talk about it here uh, and share my experience and my feelings about the film with you. I will say, first of all, right off the bat, this is easily the most powerful film that I have seen from director Guillermo del Toro since his masterpiece, his fantasy masterpiece, Pan's Labyrinth. And I can say walking out of the theater that I knew right away I I'm definitely going to want to own this movie. If you haven't seen the film yet, perhaps you've already heard about it, you've maybe seen the poster, maybe you've seen the trailer or heard people talk about it. And if so, you know that on one level it is a monster movie. It's also a love story too, though. A love story about a woman who falls in love with a monster. You know, as I walked out of the movie theater, I found myself thinking about a comic book series that I used to read years ago called Love and Rockets. Uh, the book is written and drawn by uh, two L.A. residents, uh, Jamie and Gilbert Hernandez, who are brothers and who are some of the finest talents working in modern comics. And I remember there was one story in the series, just a little side story, where this character, I, is he sitting in a movie theater? And he's watching an old-style monster movie. And, uh, and you know, you've, you've seen in these films how, you know, you always see the monster holding on to the girl in his arms, she's passed out, that sort of thing. And in the, fi in, in the comic book story, the main character is there in the theater, and his thought balloon, uh, he's thinking to himself, why are the women always so afraid of the monsters in these movies? Why do they always run away from them? Can't they tell they're just lonely? And as I walked out of the theater, I couldn't help but wonder if maybe uh, Guillermo del Toro had read this comic book at some point in time in his life. After uh, I got out of the theater, it was late. I had to go home, get ready for bed because I had to be up for work in the morning. But uh, today when I got home from work, I went online and I found an interview with him where he talks about this film. And he does mention that as a kid, he saw the movie, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. And as a kid, he figured, well, I'll bet it'll go well for the monster and he'll get the girl at the end. Of course, it doesn't go that way. So to a certain extent, this film is kind of a wish fulfillment, reimagining of that movie, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, it's a lot of other things too. There are just layers upon layers of cinematic influences that he's paying homage to in this film, there are, within the story, there are layers of subtlety and nuance, and yet at the same time, it's just a very simple story. Now that I've had a chance to digest the film for 24 hours, I look back and I'm still amazed at how the director took me on this cinematic journey with him and how absolutely engrossed I was from start to finish, and how absolutely plugged in I was to each and every character in this film. I felt like I understood every single character. I, even the film's villain, played by Michael Shannon, I felt plugged even into his character too, and understood who these characters were about and what they wanted. And all of these characters seemed to be feeling like their lives aren't complete and like they're missing something in life. Even the film's villain has a similar motivation as our film's heroes. And I've also found myself falling absolutely in love with the character that is portrayed by actress Sally Hawkins in the film. Uh, she plays, uh, well, of course, the character is mute. Uh, I was going to say this very quiet, gentle person. She's mute, so obviously she's quiet. She can't say anything. But she is just this very gentle character who forms a bond with this monster. She works in this highly classified government facility as a cleaning woman. And so she has access to this area uh, simply because someone has to keep the place clean. 
Once again, there are just a lot of things about this film that really impressed me. But if I had to pick out just one thing, and I'm going to be spoilery here right now if you haven't seen the film yet, but in the film's later half, there's a moment where this film, this drama, monster movie, love story, transitions into a Busby Berkeley musical number. And I, I kid you not, a Busby Berkeley musical number right out of the 1930s, right out of the 1940s. You know, we're talking Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers. Instead of being this jarring tonal shift, instead of suddenly this, you, you know, being taken out of the movie, instead of this being hysterical and funny, this moment that should have been just like, oh, you've got to be kidding me, is very sad, very heart-wrenching, and tremendously poetic. And when I walked out of the theater, I kept thinking about that scene, and I thought, how did he do this? How did the director insert this scene into this film that should have not worked. It should have been just the biggest fail in the whole movie. It should have been a total, tonal failure. And how did he do this so well that when I look at it now, this film would be incomplete without this musical number. It would be absolutely incomplete. How did he pull this off? And it's just, one of the amazing things about this film. I do want to stress that this is a rated R film. It is not for your kids. This is a monster movie. It doesn't shy away from the gruesomeness that can be associated with these types of films. This is also a film that does depict uh, uh, sexual activity as well. And yet none of that comes off as lurid or exploitational. I also want to take a moment to commend the filmmaker for portraying this particular character who is handicapped as a sexual person, as a person who has sexual feelings. Very early on in the film, we get a glimpse into her, into this aspect of her life. And I think this is very important because we, I think we still have a tendency in our society to view people who are handicapped as non-sexual. So I, I do appreciate that they did portray this. She's also, once again, a very uh, a quiet, not because she's mute, but just her personality is, is one of being quiet, being timid, um, not drawing attention to herself, modest, and a character who is very gentle. We also tend to think of characters with those traits, people with those traits, as once again, not being sexual. And, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. So I'm really pleased that they portrayed it this way in this film. It's amazing to me that I could sit in a theater and watch a movie where a woman has a sexual relationship with a fish man, monster, whatever. And when I walk out of the theater, the first thing I think is that this is one of the most poetic films I've seen in quite some time. I'm not going to say too much more, just in case you haven't seen the film. And if you haven't seen it yet, and as long as you are okay with the stronger R-rated elements that I've mentioned, then by all means, you need to see this film. If you have seen the film already, I would love to hear what you think. I would look forward to talking to you about it in the comments section. So please, please comment. And um, once again, this is not a formal review, just kind of going off the top of my head with some of my initial impressions of the film. Just had to talk about it. Um, as always, thank you so much for subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. Be sure to click notifications so you can know when I create new videos. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.